as this evening completes the series of five talks which have been planned for this seminar, I would like first of all to gather up one or two loose ends that have come to attention. One or two of the friends are a little uncertain about uh, some matters, therefore with your permission we will briefly reiterate one or two phases of our problem. In the last talk, we mentioned that the over-self or inner nature of the small child or the babe is not essentially different from that of the adult, and that growth is a revelation of potential rather than a creation of potential. This means primarily that in terms of the broader aspects, certainly of Oriental philosophy, the individual is born into this world not as a beginner, but as a traveler, or uh, passing from one caravansary or rest house to another along the pilgrimage of existence. While the newborn babe is apparently quite helpless, and we must await the natural processes by means of which its individuality will emerge to our recognition. This does not mean that the individuality which we observe is being generated at the time we observe it. Rather, it is a gradual release through an increasingly adequate instrument so that by the time of maturity or majority, we are inclined to assume that the individual, having now possession of the instrument which he has fashioned and which was created for the purpose of expressing his internal individuality, the individual would be able to express himself on the level of his own maturity. Now this again does not imply that by this maturity he reaches some over-perfection. He is releasing himself as he is. But we do know that this potential makes possible a maturity that is greater than childhood. It makes possible the gradual revelation of the cultural person through the biological structure. To say that there is an essential difference between the child at three and the adult of 21 would be to assume that in the 18 intervening years there has been a marked or noticeable degree of cultural attainment. We are not in a position to say that this is true. We are only in a position to say that until the individual reaches his majority, we cannot determine even with relative accuracy his actual cultural level. Consequently, evolution or growth which certainly does take place within the internal life of the individual, is not measured in the years from infancy to adulthood, but just as the person having achieved maturity is then in the best position and condition to make rapid advancement in his own cultural life. So the advancement is made in maturity and is not reflected in the growth from childhood toward maturity. By the time he has attained maturity, he has attained to his own heritage, whatever this heritage may be. On this heritage he builds. Here is the parallel to psychic growth, namely that psychic growth is attained when the instruments necessary for its attainment have been brought to their maturity. Then the individual grows as a being. Prior to that time he is attaining the level of his achieved growth, and he is doing this by means of the gradual unfoldment of an organism capable of sustaining a more complete expression of his internal life. There is no conflict, therefore, in this statement, namely that the individual, for all purposes, is not essentially different as a small child uh, than he will be as an adult person. We may hope, however, that between the period of adulthood and the end of his material life, he will make major steps in the unfoldment of his internal culture. In this way, attaining the essential growth for which this life was intended. 
I hope that that will clarify that point for the friend who was interested. Now this evening we have a rather serious problem to consider because wherever we approach the dimensions of prophecy or go on into uh, elements relating to the shape of things to come, we tread upon extremely dangerous ground. And the individual who is in the greatest problem with this matter is the one who is laboring under a fixed pattern of opinions. He has grave trouble in escaping from levels which he has created in his own thinking and to which he forces progress to conform. Therefore, in connection with this, there are certain definite factors we have to consider. The first is perhaps a clearer understanding of the difference between race and culture. Actually, these terms are not even nearly synonymous. A race is a biological instrument. It is a descent by means of structure and within a biological framework of generation and heredity. A race, therefore, as we have suggested, is a kind of biological unit. Culture is not, in any sense of the word, biological. And anthropology immediately separates itself from biology on this ground. Culture is not directly associated with race. It is not the primary product of race. It is not essentially the primary end or result for which race is devised. Culture stands as something which is essentially larger, deeper, and more meaningful than any biological differentiation. Modern anthropology, therefore, takes the ground that all races have a certain common essential capacity for culture, that culture can be transmitted from race to race at any time, that culture can be brought forth out of racial groups without any serious impediment due to racial demarcations or separations. Every biological racial unit is capable of heterogeneous cultural growth. It is capable of evolving culture from its own experience. It is capable of maturing culture through contact with other culture groups. It is also capable of extending its own culture into other areas and into other periods of time. Culture, therefore, cuts through all such boundaries as we generally associate with biological heredity or racial differentiation. The modern anthropologist takes it for granted that all races participate in culture and that all races can make cultural contributions to other races. Cultural contribution is, however, very largely a matter of appreciation. The barrier lies in the homogeneity of the older racial developments. The race is raised arbitrary, artificial barriers in many instances against the cultures of other people. This does not mean that these barriers originated in biology. They originated possibly in the psychological interpretation of biological differences. They originated in a man assuming that the color of his skin affected his cultural insight, or that by his material structure, or by other external factors, areas in which he lived, and things of that nature, his cultural life must be uh, modified, changed, reduced, or restricted. This, however, has nothing to do with race, biologically speaking. This has to do with the gradual emergence of race culturally limiting itself by its own culture. This type of position we observe among some ancient peoples, and we also observe that progress is more rapid in those areas where these restrictions have naturally disappeared or have been overcome by contact with other peoples. 
Thus we may say for our essential purpose that the future, looking into the future of man as an anthropological unit, anthropology takes the square and certain ground that the final total richness of human culture must result from contributions from all culture groups. That these contributions should not be regarded as conflicting, but as commonly enriching. We are beginning to appreciate this perhaps more than was considered conceivable a hundred years ago. Today we are beginning to recognize that culture breaks through most of the arbitrary boundaries which we have established. Perhaps one of the most obvious instances of this is on the level of arts perhaps somewhat on the level of music. We are beginning to see it on the level of theater and also in crafts and now in sciences. We are beginning to recognize, for example, the importance of the cultural, cultural contributions of Asia merely in terms of architecture, in terms of commodities, in terms of decoration and decor of all kinds, in terms of clothing, uh, weavings, fabrics, designs. We find in our California homes a tremendous tendency today towards the recognition of the uh, architectural desirability of the Japanese house and garden. And we're becoming aware of this type of thing. Anthropology tells us that this awareness of the desirability of the culture of other peoples, this in itself is one of the most powerful agents towards world peace and towards the common understanding of mankind. When we really understand and share the culture of other people, we gain an insight into them, not possible on an intellectual level, and certainly not even suspected on a biological level. Today, the family, which certainly would view with grave apprehension an interracial marriage, is not at all unhappy over uh, furnishing their home according to the decor of the race they would not want their child to marry into. We have, therefore, a meeting on a cultural level and no meeting on a biological level. This, in turn, does not necessarily, with the anthropologist, become important. To him, biology, per se, is a subject in itself, and biology is going to make very slight contribution to the solution of cultural problems. Therefore, it is far more important that we become aware of the cultures of people than that we become too profoundly involved in the study of their racial demarcations. Uh, race, because of its physical implications, is a difficult barrier to move. Culture, because it is intangible in itself, and because it applies to a group of faculties and powers, not as easily prejudiced as certain others, we find culture moving in where the individual himself who created the culture would not be acceptable. We have also many instances today in which uh, individuals with very slight sympathy uh, for the uh, uh, national or racial groups uh, with which he comes in contact, paying large sums of money uh, to secure their art or to become trained in their dance or their theater or their music. Uh, these cultural points also strengthen the concept of the anthropologist, namely that culture has absolutely no boundaries except those which are placed upon it by human prejudice, and that it is the gradual restoration of the universality of culture that will make a marked contribution to the future of humanity. Now on the problem of this difference between biological and anthropological issues. Uh, anthropology gives us three very interesting and important lines of thinking or fields or areas to examine. Uh, these areas he considers as indicative of the uh, fundamental issues with which we are faced. One is nationality, the second is language, and the third is religion. These are three good examples of the essential difference between anthropology and biology. Nationality, for example, were it biological, 
would mean the inevitable conformity of race and nation. This is not true in actual fact. There are cases, and we have them today, which we call homogeneous peoples. A homogeneous person in this concept is one whose nationality, language, and religion are all within one area. That is, the religion does not go beyond the boundaries of its nation. Its nation does not go beyond the boundaries of its racial uh, habitat, the area in which it existed, and the language is homogeneous or unique to that people and has not easily been conveyed to other peoples. Thus there are peoples of nations, and when you mention them, you almost inevitably tell, when you say, for example, that this individual is Chinese, you most almost certainly think of him as Chinese racially and culturally, because race and culture, in this case, are very closely associated. On the other hand, there are many groups where such uh, cultivation of isolation as uh, crippled China for many thousands of years uh, is not so noticeable. And uh, we do find that within racial structure, <coughs> nations rise and fall. We will have a nation, and of course we can think of one outstanding example, the British Commonwealth of Nations in which practically every race, every culture, and every religion exist together, or are found within a broad, so-called, national pattern. Perhaps the most immediate example that we realize is our own nation, in which we have uh, not only religions from everywhere, and nationalities from everywhere, gradually mingling into our nationality, but we also have a variety of languages which, while they gradually disappear, do not entirely vanish with the result that in most of our large communities there are still areas or districts in which local customs, local languages, and local religions are very largely preserved intact. And yet a larger nationality uh, absorbs them or takes them into a situation. A man will say, I am a Buddhist, I am Chinese, and I am an American citizen. We have now a new kind of pattern indicating that Buddhism, Chinese, are not incompatible with Americanism as a national entity. We can say the same of many, so that are not impossible on some festive occasion for us to quickly draw together 40 or 50 nations for some celebration or some uh, exchange of fraternal good wishes. And these things bespeak the fact that nation is not biological, nor shall we assume that language is biological, or religion biological. Religion is divisible, like most other branches of human thought, into two grand groups. Those religions which are homogeneous, and those which are, which are heterogeneous. There are religions that have extended very little beyond the boundaries of their original ground, and where, either by obligation, by tradition, or by other circumstances, they are still bound very close to race and also to nation. Against these are three great religions and they are the most vital and active religions that we have in the world today. Christianity, Buddhism, and Islamism. All of these are heterogeneous religions. Uh, they are not religions which require that you live in a country, that you belong to a nation, that you stem from a race, or uh, that you uh, belong only in communities and areas where such faiths are prominent you have almost complete freedom. Buddhism, probably, is an example of Eastern heterogeneity, for it has influenced every racial and national group in Asia. Christianity has done the same to the West and has to some degree penetrated Asia. Uh, the um, Islamism is now represented in 228 national units. Therefore, these religions have broken through nations 
proving that culture, again, is larger than nationality. And nationality, in its turn, has proven that it is larger than biology. This largeness uh, to the anthropologist becomes the basis of a credo. And he, in his own little way, or large way, as we wish to look at it, believes that he is making a vital and valuable contribution by making the science of internationalism the basis of culture. Now, he is not referring to internationalism as a manner of destroying cultural entity. He is uh, rather turning it a means of establishing or recognizing a fact which has always existed, uh, namely that cultures are not essentially competitive, that cultures are also not essentially comparative, that cultures constitute a motion toward common good, and that therefore that uh, the future, a future of better and wiser people, will be a future enriched by many cultural motions. Contrary to biology also, the anthropologist views culture as essentially unhistorical. The fact that a people has disappeared and has not existed as a political unit or a national unit or a racial unit for two, three, four, or five thousand years, or that its religion has been dead for a thousand years, these circumstances do not mean that these so-called vanished factors are not of continuing cultural significance. In other words, Egypt, as far as classical Egypt is concerned, is dead. The modern Egyptian does not belong to the ancient dynastic lines at all. He is an Arab who has moved in at a comparatively recent date. Yet can we say that Egypt as a cultural entity is dead? Not as long as we still use its architectural motives in the development of public buildings. Not as long as we still admire its art and use this art to decorate our homes. And not, not as long as hundreds of living scholars write books about this dead country, telling its virtues and uh, pointing out many of its cultural achievements which can be useful to us even in our own time. Therefore, history permits us to share in the cultural achievements of other peoples. And history through this also gives us the opportunity to res restore or resurrect, at least as intellectual food for contemplation, uh, the peculiar achievements of these people in varying directions, particularly as it may bear upon problems of today, or which they may have approached more successfully than we have, or have run into difficulties by, of which we should be aware lest we follow in the same course. Thus culture is unhistorical and is broken through in a very different way from the biological descent of races. Actually, in anthropology, the overthought is that we shall gradually gain a common level of heritage in culture and that this culture is the basis of our ultimate capacity or ability to live together as one world. This, as I say, does not imply that anthropology is particularly interested in imposing blanket cultures upon people. This most anthropologists today regard as a very serious defect and at the very least premature. In other words, we have had some very interesting experiences working today with peoples outside of our own culture groups. The tendency of these peoples, particularly in small and isolated areas, is to gradually vanish. And one of the uh, points that perhaps we can mention at the moment is the uh, influence of African art upon European art culture. Uh, men like Baudel came very strongly and powerfully under African art impulse. We also find uh, a number of the so-called outstanding moderns, such as Picasso, admitting their indebtedness to the primitive cultures of the French Sudan, Bali, and other um, comparatively isolated areas. Uh, these artists 
regardless of how we may regard them, personally felt a great obligation to what they regarded as the dynamic sincerity of the primitive. They found in it an escape from the overworking, uh, the meticulous uh, loss of value that came from a more or less homogeneity of our culture in Europe at a previous date. They found Europe to be more or less drowning in its own traditional arts and unable to break through into a larger art consciousness. Now these artists and anthropologists who worked with them and who do the situation realize that the work that they wish to do must be done quickly inasmuch as the native primitive arts were rapidly disappearing. They were disappearing under the impact of the contact of other cultures. Other cultures, uh, largely egocentric and arrogant, were simply imposing themselves upon these people, ridiculing the achievements of these primitive culture groups and trying to sweep them into the common mechanistic art concepts of our time. And experience has shown that 25 years after these tribes and groups came under so-called modern cultural influence, their native arts deteriorated to nothing. And today, examples purchased in those areas are not worth bringing home. Uh, the uh, impact of the foreign culture on the grounds that our way was better, that our arts were superior and our culture more advanced, wiped out something which we will sometime wish had survived in some way. The point the anthropologist would like to make is that the relationships of culture should not be one imposing itself dogmatically upon another, but each culture attempting as far as possible to mature and draw out the culture of other groups, realizing the infinite potential that is locked even within the most savage concept of life. That if this can be unfolded, if it can be allowed to move uh, under protection and direction, but without overshadowing and overwhelming, it will reveal things to us that we really want to know. It is very much like the bringing up of the child. If we destroy the child's individuality, we produce the type of person who makes no further contribution to himself or anyone else. The problem is how can we direct the child? How can we prevent the child from come, falling in common pitfalls which will be injurious to it? How can we lead it without dominating it? How can we educate it without destroying its individuality? How can we help it to be itself? And by what wonderful virtue can we restrain ourselves from attempting to overwhelm it with ourselves so that it becomes merely a cut-out likeness of the dominating influences? Uh, the anthropologist feels that much more time and thought should be given to the protection of the cultural spirit of peoples. And he also points out that one of the deadly enemies of culture is the commercialization of arts and cultural factors. That the individual uh, moving from the expression of himself because he is himself to the pure mechanical labor of working for profit alone, this transition is one of the most terrible down motions that exists within a world of culture. The reduction of culture to economic terms is the extinction of culture. And uh, this situation takes on tremendous force, even in our way of life, where pride of work is rapidly disappearing, and the penalty upon creativity is becoming heavier than the average person can carry. Now, one of the out outstanding reasons for this bad state of affairs is ignorance. And the ignorance centers heavily in the field of anthropology. The average individual is not informed as to what may be regarded as the ethics of cultural relationships. And as a result of that, he is unable to take a mature position himself. The same is true so often of parents and certainly of community activities, and we see traces of it 
uh, unfortunately developing even in our educational fields where things should be different. The release of the individual is being forgotten and the process of transforming him into a robot according to the common acceptances of his time. This progress, a process, is advancing far too rapidly. So we have here this uh, concept which anthropology wishes to point to the future of things. And as we say, in some matters we may not be completely uh, in harmony with the anthropological viewpoint, but in certain other matters we certainly have a strong sympathy for it and a recognition of its importance. Progress in terms of anthropology is progress in terms of culture. Now culture is not, uh, we will say, organization. It is not uh, the factory procedure. Culture could not exist or could not conceive the desirability of a world which is gradually transformed into a vast laboratory or a vast economic enterprise or a factory or a superstore. Uh, these uh, ends uh, for the effort of man through the ages would be regarded as cultural suicide. It would be the final extinction of everything by means of which man has achieved distinction from other animal creatures. For he could scarcely arrive at a more satisfactory uh, industrial organization than that which has been attained by the ants. That is not the end for which he is devised. Anthropology, therefore, points out that progress cannot and must not be on a level. Tomorrow must not be today plus only more of the same. And this uh, uh, is a very important point. The man who has one factory, looking into the future in terms of success, must not come to consider success the possession of two factories. And that is one of our very serious weaknesses. He must not consider that he is successful because starting with one store, he ends with a chain of 400 stores. This has absolutely nothing to do with culture. He can achieve this, be born a barbarian and die a barbarian. It has no cultural significance whatsoever. The same is true of all motion on levels. Uh, the individual thinking in terms of one nation, composed of many nations, like they are now, only perhaps uniting through absolute political necessity, each one remaining the same kind of belligerent character it is today and depending for their unity upon legislation or the arising of an autocrat who can force that unity upon them. This has no cultural significance whatever and has no future. It is simply the same thing getting bigger without getting better. Therefore, anything that gets bigger without getting better is suffering from a kind of bloat or something of that nature. When a little dog swells up, we are not impressed. We know that it is not growing, it is merely sick. <laughs> and there are a great many things that we consider as expansion, which are very little more than bloat, leaving none of the essential values touched and accomplishing nothing which is going to make this a better world for anyone to live in. Over organization the tremendous and continuous development of things as they are pushed into the future means nothing. Nor does it mean anything that things as they are shall be done better in the future. The question is, will better things be done in the future? The concept, for instance, that we are now able to travel in an aeroplane at any convenient speed from 300 miles an hour to 1200 miles an hour should not cause us to assume that when we can travel up 
2,000 miles an hour, we have attained anything whatsoever in terms of culture. We have not. We have only increased the danger of accident and have, in all probabilities, fallen under a spell which will leave us no rest until we can go 3,000 miles an hour. But in our way of thinking, we are trying to push a way of life that is not mature into tomorrow, so as to make tomorrow merely the fulfillment of the unfinished experiments of today. Now we may, of course, through a certain amount of this kind of motion, ultimately achieve accidentally or incidentally a certain amount of culture. We will gain culture through regret for one thing, which is one way in which most persons choose to learn. We may also, in the course of our exploration of space, come upon a culture group stronger than our own, which may give us pause for thought. We may also find in our experimentation, in the form of byproducts, certain things which will advance human life, human security, and by so doing, offer man increased cultural opportunity. But if he does not make use of this opportunity, then his cultural uh, growth still remains unchanged. A good and common example of that is the matter of conveniences and commodities that we have today. The average person today is surrounded with so many labor-saving devices that we would assume that he would have saved sufficient time to have devote something to culture. But the average person is busier than he ever was and is not advancing culturally at all. One individual told me that the great trouble was that all his conveniences were out of order most of the time and it took him more time to keep them running than he had previously expanded in doing the various things for which they substituted. <laughs> also, he is under the heavy uh, load of financing these productions, which require greater effort and greater labor and greater servitude to his own conveniences. We, regardless of how we look at it, we must admit that this age, which 50 years ago we were solemnly assured would give man the leisure to be great, has given him no leisure at all and very little sign of greatness. He is perhaps even a little more confused and a little more nervous and a little sicker than he was before all these good things were added unto him. The, uh, the cultural progress has not been achieved. Thus anthropology comes to our aid with a very, very simple but overwhelming concept that all so-called progress must ascend. It must be a motion forward and upward, not simply a motion forward. And the only way a motion can move both forward and upward is that the motion itself shall have the strength of forward motion. And those regulating the motion shall have the consciousness of upward motion. And if these two do not work together, we land on a level. And uh, while we don't agree with the pre-Columbian uh, concept, that if you went far enough in any direction you'd fall off the earth, it is still quite conceivable that we will fall off something if our culture does not gain wings of its own in some way to carry us over uh, the uh, level of problem for which we have as yet no solution. And the anthropology assures us that we can never secure solution out of the problem itself. That we, in every instance, solution must be bestowed. And this bestowal arises from the conscious capacity of man to give something to the things that he does. This thing that he must do is to give them wings that they may have not only advancement, but have means of ascension into a higher plane or level of usefulness. So anthropology uh, points out that in the progress of advancement as we have it today, culture is our weakest point, that it is the ignored value, that it is an intangible to most people, 
but is more real than tangible things. For upon culture uh, is dependent use, proper use. And without the understanding which improves the level of usages, our, our sciences will go on on a level because usage requiring better rather than more will force betterness. But usage demanding only more will only force further abundance of the same thing, which is not solutional to our problem at all. The anthropologist also points out uh, that the greatest drive in the world is the culture drive. And that when anything happens to the culture drive, uh, the forward motion of everything begins to lag. The individual is always moved by overtones. He is moved by dreams, by hopes, by aspirations, uh, by the desire of fulfilling some internal power pressure within his own consciousness. Where this is removed as an incentive, and the individual feels himself frustrated in the search for self-expression or the expression of culture through himself. He gradually lags on every other level of life. It is like the person whose psychology is confused. And in a short time, this confusion causes him to be inefficient as a businessman, causes him to be inefficient as a family person, and causes him gradually to lose even the desire to live. The loss of the desire to live is very often associated with the loss of cultural drive, the loss of the drive to make the world better and more beautiful rather than merely bigger and stronger. This means uh, that to anthropology, the future of the world must depend upon its cultural leadership. And it points out that this has always been the case, that uh, the truly honored names, the great people who are remembered, are for the most part powerful culture units. We admire the individuals who have left us beauty more than we admire those who have left us strength. Uh, we may write some histories about Napoleon and people of that nature, but in our simple daily living, we are much closer to our poets, to our mystics, to our scholars, to our artists. Uh, we, we feel a kinship with that which is lovable and is essentially beautiful and good. And we bestow gradually, and perhaps very tardily, our applause upon those who have made such contributions. Thus, instinctively, we seek culture, and we seek cultural outlet. But we do not know exactly how to make it fit into the present program of things. Anthropology, like all other branches of learning, appeals to both individuals and to groups. As an individual, the attainment of culture is perhaps easier than it is on a collective level. At the same time, however, uh, collective momentums, once they can be created, once they can be caused to move, uh, very often carry whole groups of persons with them along the road to some powerful cultural achievement. So anthropology says that tomorrow, the future of the world in which we live, is a future very skillfully and wonderfully uh, compounded out of the beauty, out of the truth, out of the nobility that has preceded us, plus the vision which we ourselves can bestow, and the coordination which the contemporary must always impose upon the fragments of non-contemporary ideas. Thus we gather, we bring together that which has previously been given and use it as an immediate instrument of insight and interpret it, uh, rearrange it, and cause it to fit into the pressing need of beauty or of truth or of wisdom or of love within our own existence and our own personal culture problem. So 
So the uh, anthropologist takes it for granted that if the world a hundred years from now is merely a further exaggeration of the present world, that the future is merely the present pushed into the next century, that we are going to be in a very bad way, and that in all probabilities if we push the now far enough, we will simply exterminate ourselves. Uh, this point is uh, defensible on grounds of examining other peoples who got into ruts by which they were unable to keep the cultural sky clear above them. They lost the power to be free to become better. And in so doing, they signed their own death warrants. Actually, however, nature is such that it is very difficult to lock man totally within a mechanistic pattern. He rebels of himself. The pattern becomes too heavy for him. He finds himself sicker and sicker under it until on one level or another he rebels. Therefore, man by instinct is a breaker of patterns. He is a constant rebel against the authorities which lock him. And for this reason alone, despotism can seldom permanently achieve its ends. These ends create so much reaction that the despotism itself is ultimately overthrown. However, with the present type of mind, anthropology points out the danger of the contamination of imagination by our present way of life. Actually, our imagination or the inner life of the creativity of the person, if this becomes infected to the degree that he can not find anything more beautiful than what he is doing, or that what he is doing satisfies him so completely that he is not culturally hungry. This is bad, this is dangerous. And that is the reason why it is an unfortunate that science, religion, literature, art, music, and all of these diversified elements which should make up culture all become locked in one pattern. If this is so, then there is no open ground for rebellion. There is no obvious need for things to be different. And the individual escaping from one pattern falls into only another bracket of the same pattern. And in this way, gains no true relief or release from pattern. Culture is always associated with a kind of archetype. Every people has had its dream. It has had some deeply submerged purpose which drives it, which has prevented it from extinction, which has caused it to defend its institutions uh, to the bitter end. This drive has always in it some utopian clause or phase. It is always in some way the belief that we all live by that tomorrow is going to be a little better. This problem of tomorrow being better, of course, runs against philosophy, for tomorrow can only be better if we make it better. And the problem of hope without work also offers no tangible solution. But it is dangerous to us as individuals and as groups to think of better, this better tomorrow, without seeing or feeling in it any release or expression for the instinctive desire of our own for happiness, peace, security, friendliness, kindliness, cooperation, and understanding. When we cannot look forward to these as having some advancement, then we are locked within the very selfish and dubious pattern of some way transferring or attempting to find consolation merely in toys which in themselves solve nothing. And the idea of the rocket reaching the moon is a kind of a toy 
which we use uh, and which becomes important to us very largely to the degree that we are a frustrated neurotic people. Not that this will actually bring us any happiness, but we will become wildly excited the day it happens. Uh, we will all shake hands with everybody, feel that we have made a monumental step in the conquest of existence, and then go right on with exactly the same personal problems we have always had. And if uh, it should happen that somewhere along the line we happen to find a warlike planet that looks like it might want to invade us or something of that nature, the discovery will bring us not peace but further fears, doubts, and misgivings. So actually, we have no reason to assume uh, that any type of activity which has failed to produce happiness in the past is likely to produce it in the future. And what we term happiness is becoming more and more a sort of resigning to inevitables. It's a very static thing. The individual doing the best he can, which is very poor, and uh, hoping for the best without very much ground or hope in that direction. If, on the other hand, culture is allowed to have its own way, the anthropologist can see a great many things that desperately need the doing. And he bases his concepts now upon his own scientific estimation of what has been done. He examines the great motion of culture itself. Not the motion that we have imposed upon it, but the grand motion, which can be estimated perhaps only in terms of 10, 20, 50, or 100,000 years. He perceives dimly that there is a grand strategy in this moral, ethical, cultural motion within and around man. He perceives that where man does not know where he is going, that there is a motion that will carry him there if he will let it carry him there. And that this motion is not mysterious or inexplicable in itself. That it is a reasonable motion. And out of certain experiences that he has observed and studied, and which he approaches almost psychologically, in recognizing the results of various errors in culture upon the groups where these errors arose. The anthropologist sees himself moving along towards something that could be very much better than it is today, and which he feels uh, has importance. He thinks of science as making certain definite contributions to this. Not because science primarily uh, may have intention of contributing to culture, although many scientists undoubtedly do feel the importance of their cultural contribution. There are certain things, however, which science makes possible. And these things are essentially, perhaps, under two headings communication and transportation. These two are perhaps among the most important scientific contributions to culture. Communication, while it begins with a problem that is unsolved, still offers a suggestion for solution. It is interesting that scientifically we should have invented means of carrying the human voice around the world long before we invented any means by which the people listening could come to understand each other's words. It is interesting that we have world communication on a mechanical level, on an electrical level, and we still have language barriers by means of which this marvelous invention is prevented from reaching three quarters of its potential audience. This is an example of where science, ignoring culture, is now faced with a debit. 
The Voice of America, trying to work, for instance, in uh, the Iron Curtain countries, has quite an elaborate procedure on its hands. It must bring in individuals of many languages and have these programs carefully translated for the benefit of people who do not speak each other's languages, but we hope sometime will work together in economically, politically, or culturally. So we have solved the great problem of communication, but not the basic one. Namely, that communication is a problem of individuals having a spoken word in common. Thus, anthropology points out the tremendous importance of the development and final recognition of an international language. This is both uh, anthropologically and politically indicated. And uh, we've had experiments, but most of them have been half-hearted. Perhaps the outstanding experiment up to the present time has been Esperanto. But we still are faced with the problem that science now makes it possible for men to communicate with each other. And through various devices such as television, motion pictures, things of that nature, it is possible for us to share very largely in the cultural lives of other people. But in our motion pictures, most cases, these sharings are destroyed by the falsification of the documentation. No effort is made for authenticity. And for that reason, we think we are sharing and we become more befuddled than before. And one of our school teacher not long ago told me that it's very difficult to teach children history when they are exposed to motion pictures in which history is distorted out of all shape and form in the effort to preserve or to create uh, some falsified romantic situation. A next problem that we do have that can be anthropologically significant is transportation. Here we have the possibility of the individual moving quickly into other culture groups and also moving toward the experience of world contact with culture. Areas totally isolated 50 years ago are now accessible in terms of ours. It is perfectly possible for the individual to have first-hand contact with his world. Transportation also breaks down the immediate isolation of purely local cultural patterns. A hundred years ago, only one person in ten left an area of a hundred miles of his birthplace during his lifetime. Today, nearly everyone has the opportunity of looking over the fence into somebody else's yard and see what is going on there. This is culturally significant, but loses most of its value unless these elements are emphasized, pointed out, and given an opportunity to bear their proper fruit. Of course, world trade also has an effect on culture, for culture has always, almost automatically, followed the trade routes. And where we enter a country, perhaps largely to buy its goods, we may ultimately share its culture. This was, has been a common experience for the last 10,000 years. Anthropology then points out the importance at this particular phase of coming into a rational communion with world culture and very definitely points out that cultures do not overlap nearly as much as we think they do. It is still possible to distinguish practically all cultural patterns, even if you mix them up. You can rediscover the separate threads and put them together again. Cultures are highly complementary. Against the complementary relation of culture is your highly competitive attitude of so-called superior peoples. Anthropology says that one thing we've got to get out of our system forever is the concept of superior people. That we must have the concept of essentially different people, each one to be measured by its own yardstick and recognized for its potential contributions to a total culture as yet incomplete. 
if any race or nation or culture group had performed the miracle of producing a perfect culture, then we might say that others are not necessary. But we stand as we have always stood, in the immediate need of additional complementary culture. And we assume that the natural way to find that is to go where it is. Not to think on terms of borrowing or of lending, but of recognizing that culture is a unit, a totality, revealing itself through an infinite diversity of culture patterns and culture groups. Taking this as a foundation, we can work for a unity of cultures, even as we work for a political unity. And we can work for religious unity, even as we work for scientific unity. We observe with some interest that a great many scientists belonging to other and different nations, even some that are not compatible with our own political theories, as men and as scientists can gather and discuss and think and talk things over without the animosities that you normally might expect. For wherever the individual has ideas bigger than himself, he can share those ideas with others on a like cultural level. And wherever it's impossible to share, there is evidence that the cultural bonds are not strong enough. And without these bonds, the peace of the future can never be assured. In this way, anthropology, looking forward into the future, is not content to think in terms of the new conveniences, the new commodities, and the new situations that may arise in the management of our temporal and commercial activities. There must be this new world, this new wonderful and beautiful world that we desperately need in order to justify our existence now or any other time. Assuming that the motion of culture is genuine, that the anthropologist is correct, that he has dimly perceived this motion and is able to project it into the future, and therefore that a hundred years from now will not merely be today pushed into tomorrow, but will be uh, a, an ascending arc of attainment, an achievement uh, beyond and above uh, the continuation of things as they are. How will he estimate or conceive this new level of life to be? He tells us that the only answer to that that is within his jurisdiction is the concept that this ascent means that more of the inside of man will come out, and more of the good things we have always known uh, will be apparent than are now obvious. In consequence of this, there will be a fulfillment, to a degree at least, of man's and most secret longings and hopings, as well as this motion forward. Therefore, that in a hundred years from now, we will say, it is perfectly conceivable that man, becoming more anthropologically conscious of the concept of culture, may bring about marked changes in the three departments uh, which we have already mentioned, namely the departments of nationality, and of religion, and of language. Uh, the anthropologist feels convinced that the progress of world language will go on more rapidly than it has uh, in the past. Not impelled simply by cultural motive, but by economic motive. But achieving in its ultimate end the establishment of a more common understanding between human beings. This understanding may at first not be a true sharing of language. It may begin as it has already begun, in the greater ability of translation, uh, the appearance of the better literary works of various groups in the published languages of other groups. So that today we can look forward uh, to a greater availability of world literature and will be in this country, for example, relieved 
of the overburden of Mediterranean literature and the total lack of literature from practically every other part of the world. The anthropologist will nod his head with a certain quiet sense of satisfaction when he realizes that now probably a hundred or two hundred of the world's great classics from every nation can be found in book form at under fifty cents a copy. He feels this is important because the individual who today begins to study these or to read them even superficially is building the beginnings of cultural bridges. He is beginning to create what culture must have and that is sympathy, a certain tolerance, a certain understanding, the amazing and incredible discovery that somebody beside himself has done something in this world. That he is not a patriot because he closes his eyes to the achievements of everyone but his own. That anthropology calls him to a higher patriotism, and that is a patriotism to the common good which must be advanced, and without which the good of individual nations can never be properly advanced. The second important contribution lies in nation, national psychology. A national psychology is also in the process of being broken down. And we find greater and greater economic and cultural exchange between nations than we have ever known before. So that we are in a cultural motion, although as yet it is too slight to have any direct bearing upon the grand scheme of our living. Anthropologists are of the suspicion that if student exchanges and things like this go on for another hundred years, there will be cultural motion. That this cultural motion will mean that there will be fewer strangers in this world. And the great barrier to all true progress is the stranger. And the stranger is not only the individual from another country, but the person working alongside of us whom we have never known. The stranger is the neighbor next door we have never spoken to. And from this it extends on to the individual of other racial or biological groups with which we have never formed cultural bridges, and therefore whose life, work, and contribution to the common good we have totally ignored or terribly underestimated. Religion also comes strongly under this anthropological concept. And religion is going to be what the British so often refer to as the sticky wicket in most cases. Because religion differs in many ways from most other parts of the cultural motion, uh, and it exaggerates the difficulties which we find in the other groups. Because religion moves around revelation, and re revelation is nearly always involved in uniqueness, and uniqueness is nearly always the basis of segregation and separation. If this means, therefore, that in order to be true to your faith, you must deny all other faiths, you put a terrible barrier in the way of cultural integration. But at the same time, you are contributing markedly to the danger of war. So we have a situation of the deepest importance. Religious isolation is very apt to cause the collapse of civilization. So where does our allegiance lie? Some persons would say, go on to the bitter end. If the world falls to pieces, I've been true to my faith. This viewpoint is still quite popular, by the way. It has many more followers than we realize. But the anthropologist, who is looking objectively at the problem, and hopes that he is standing in a position in which he is not biased, comes to the realization, or comes to the conclusion, that this is too great a price to pay for religious isolation, that its moral example is more destructive than the virtue that it attains, that when we separate human beings so tremendously we should at least have extremely adequate grounds upon which to create such separation. And that, in fact, 
We have not this ground. We speak of the uniqueness of a revelation. We remove from this uniqueness proper names and nothing else, and we have nothing left that's unique. How many people realize this? We should realize it with the golden rule in 48 languages and in every religion of the world. Where, then, is this uniqueness? This uniqueness, anthropology tells us, or affirms, to be the result of miscomprehension, misunderstanding, and restriction or limitation of cultural insight. And he does not feel that the uniqueness is valuable enough, important enough, or real enough to permit it to threaten the entire progress of mankind. He therefore uh, takes what he considers to be a proper ground. Though anthropology would never attempt to force its own ideas upon man as a religion, it has no concept of doing so. Nor would it advise or advocate all men with the same religion. It does not wish to take away from man the uniqueness of what he believes to be the dispensation under which he exists. The only thing it requires of him is that he shall take a cultured attitude towards those of other beliefs. That he shall recognize the possibility of common enrichment. That in all matters that he will have a proper attitude of respect a proper attitude of sympathy, a cheerful willingness to cooperate with those of other faiths and other beliefs, and the capacity to perceive that a good man is a culture man, and that this good man has never been produced solely by one faith. That a good man is more important than an affiliated man. That the fact that the individual becomes better is the final evidence of the contribution of religion to life. Therefore, the good man, whatever he may be and whatever he may believe, is entitled to the common respect of all other good men. Anthropology is very hopeful that within a hundred years this concept will be, if not universal, far more so than it is now. We may not be able to overcome all prejudice, but anthropology points out that we are being forced into this position, often against our will, by a motion in society which cannot be stopped, and that this motion means that either we must move with it or expose ourselves to the to another cycle of holy wars. And most people at the present moment are tired of even thinking of holy wars, let alone to indulge in one. It is very doubtful if today the world could really work itself into a proper mood for a major crusade. Already the uh, violence of these attitudes has been rather seriously undermined. It is doubtful if it would get much further than a verbal outbreak. But it could. And anthropology warns that if it should, it could wreck a cultural motion for a long time to come. Anthropology hopes in its own thinking that the motion of heterogeneous faiths, the gradual recognition that we do business with people, and that this person who as socially was a stranger becomes an important element in the success of our activities. We become to be more dependent upon the farmer in Indonesia, uh, the rich uh, caliph or the rich sheikh of the Near East with his oil wells, uh, the importance of uh, the Formosa as a front line of defense against somebody else, the need of cultural contact with Japan as possibly the western boundary of our way of life. These things are forcing us 
to realize that we cannot ridicule a man and then expect him to stand with us in an emergency. So we have to at least take on an appearance of civility. This appearance coupled with greater and greater contact. I know a man who is engaged in a large business in this country. He has been an executive of that business for 40 years. He is only a few years from retirement. For the first 35 years of that position as an executive, he sat with his feet under one desk. In the last five years, he has made 42 trips around the world for his business only. This means something. It means a motion. This man has no longer the same concepts of the world that he had while his feet were under the desk. He cannot. He does not. He is discovering like a small boy a world of wonders that he never knew existed. He is, he is chuckling, he is brimming over in the fatigue which made retirement seem very attractive five years ago has disappeared and he hopes he can stay on for another ten years and keep on doing it. He has suddenly found, as we are finding, uh, what Wilkie called the one world front. That today, if you want to make a better mousetrap, you've got to import most of the materials. And that in only one or two scientific elements does the United States of America supply its own basic needs. This has its effect, and we must sometime, even as businessmen, realize that you cannot ridicule your brother's God and buy from him at a profit. It just won't work. So a, a condition is being forced upon us, meaning cultural insight. And let us not forget that the man we visit, and who in turn from some other place visits us, is passing through the same experiences that we are. Individuals who actually believed the world ended in the Sea of Yemen are suddenly discovered that it didn't. And it has been estimated that the three great dictators with whom we had trouble not so many years ago would probably not have been nearly so troublesome had any one of them been a traveler. But they were not. They had the delightful consistency of believing they lived in a small world and that there was very little other world. Thus, they were right ready to be despots, and they were. Culture thus sees the inevitable improvement of itself and the advancement of its purposes through being forced into a new relationship with peoples. The United Nations presents another phase of this. Uh, the Geneva situation is still another. Uh, the League of Nations, the Hague Conferences, all of these different motions uh, carry certain cultural overtones. But against them, the uninitiated person raises such barriers of prejudice and restriction that they, that they go far less rapidly than we would normally wish that they could. The motion cannot be stopped, however. And within the next century, we must either move with this situation or else set up blocks and barriers which will almost certainly lead us to the worst international catastrophe we have ever known. This being pretty obvious, the anthropologist feels that education should hearken to him a little more, that there should be greater emphasis in educating young people from the beginning in the fact that they are growing up on a planet and not in a community that they are growing up in a moving world and not strictly and entirely in a restricted local area. That they are going to be forced to know, understand, and own business with a great many peoples. Also, anthropology is concerned, in the United States particularly, with the unfortunate and rather limited monolinguist situation that we have here. The European has one advantage over the American in this respect. The average European speaks two to three languages. The average American does not. 
Therefore, in an emergency or under situations, he is not able to handle things as well as he should. It is only within the last 25 years that it has ever occurred to us to teach languages even to our diplomats. And there are a great many individuals holding office in various countries and representing the United States who do not speak one word of the language of the country in which they're located. This is bad. This helps to preserve prejudices and at best leaves the representation of the nation in the uncertain hands of an interpreter who can destroy the entire meaning or pervert it in any way may please him. And the most concerned individual will never know it. This uh, type of thing means bridging, bridging constant, and is the reason why the anthropologist is so concerned with language bridges. As an anthropologist also, he is not without his interest in ethnology or without interest in biological and psychological aspects of his problem. He recognizes that culture, essential culture, is the basis of what we might term integration. He realizes that the lack of culture within the individual is the principal cause of his tension. That the international lack of culture is the principal cause of international tension. International tension reacts on every individual. Individual tension, if it accumulates in enough persons, gradually assumes the form of national tension. If, therefore, unreasonable tension exists anywhere, it ultimately destroys the smooth running of whatever mechanism is involved with that tension. Consequently, anthropology looking forward into the future assumes definitely that cultural progress will have important physiological effect upon the individual. Now, if we go from the anthropological level for a moment to some of the more philosophical and abstract concepts of the future, we realize that mystical prophecies about these things all run approximately in the same thought as anthropology, but upon slightly different levels. All mystical concepts of the future imply a better world. They imply some form of general reorganization. And to most mystics, from the such seers as Swedenborg on, the future is better because the individual is a more spiritual being. That the internal growth of man brings with it the impulses and instincts to better conduct, better relationship, nobler incentives, and to a measure detachment from the great bugaboo of materialism. These things are present in all mystical prophecies concerning the future of cultures. Most of these mystical concepts, then, are not essentially different from the end uh, which culture suggests, but they go one step further, but only as culture itself would go, namely by assuming that the better world, turning about, makes a better person. That therefore man, living in a more suitable climate of conduct, collective and individual, becomes a more suitable person. Today, for example, the possibility of man possessing in a hundred years, five hundred years, or a thousand years, greater extrasensory perception range has been given a lot of thought. The fact that uh, the ESP researches have indicated that some individuals do possess a certain extrasensory uh, gamut would be anthropologically uh, interpreted as meaning that potentially all peoples have this gamut. That it is also more noticeable in so-called uh, lower culture groups. Lower in the sense of being less sophisticated, but not necessarily lower in the sense of actual value. Can we say that the individual who can perform 
acts of vision or clairvoyance or clairaudience that we cannot perform, must we assume that he's lower than we are, even though he belongs to some so-called primitive culture? He is not lower. Anthropology is not interested in height and lowness. It is simply specialization. It is simply situation making possible something which our situation seemingly has denied. On the other hand, we face this man with certain knowledge which he does not possess. And through the common sharing of this knowledge, we discover that culture is a giving and taking. That it is the individual accepting what he needs and trying seriously and honorably to convey to another that which he needs in order that we may have a free circulation of cultural attainment. Assuming that we could make a distinct 10% gain in our culture in the next hundred years, and that this 10% gain represents the cultural ascent associated with scientific progress. We could then say that in terms of the present time, we would live in a far better world than we have ever known. We would live in a world in which, for instance, we would be able to visualize solution somewhat better than we do now. For a hundred years of culture with anthropological education would give us a new insight into the true meaning of growth as growth applies to the human being, as growth applies to the individual coming of age in nature. If anthropology led this uh, study now, so that the average child of a hundred years from now was perfectly conversant with the anthropological pattern is quite possible and conceivable that this added to the 10% of progress which might normally be hoped would result in a very much broader, deeper, and wiser world than we have today. In this world there would be fewer enemies and more friends. In this world, there would be more understanding and less misunderstanding. There would also be the gradual clarification of incentives. And as one anthropologist pointed out, the one, perhaps the unique thing that anthropology can offer to man is a systematic pattern of incentives. Incentives that are desirable. Incentives that are significant. In other words, the reason for existence must be ennobled before we can hope to plan or build with any concept that is adequate. We cannot live only to extricate ourselves from immediate emergency. We cannot live today only in order that we can save ourselves from the misfortunes of yesterday. Nor can we live today only in the process of trying to block the misfortunes of tomorrow. We have to live in the concept of a gradual purpose, gradually attained by systematic effort. The moment you have this concept, you will find people putting their shoulders to the wheel. And the moment people have a vision, they will move. And this has been proven often by the most negative circumstances of history. For even tyranny has, has given men concept of something to be done. And many tyrants have brought their whole world with them to their common destruction with vast enthusiasm, simply because they had a strong program and everybody wanted to get into it. The same way a good program, strongly and firmly stated, will gain the allegiance that is now wasted and will rescue the individual from the neurosis of his own spare time. A spare time which is not necessary for his own survival and which he sees no need of applying to the survival of anything else. The idea that culture could become a hobby, could become the great avocation of mankind, is most intriguing, most stimulating. Assuming that present cultural motion continues approximately as it 
goes along today. And that meeting certain very difficult situations, we meet them with some measure of sufficiency. Not a total measure, but a, a surviving measure of efficiency. The world a hundred years from now should be politically quite different from what it appears to us today. The pattern of policy, the pattern of the means by which political ends are attained, is so faulty that culture could not permit it to go unchallenged. We must therefore reasonably expect that there would be greater emphasis upon honesty and integrity in the management of things than we recognize now. And it is quite probable that the political basis of governments and other important uh, basic principles would be largely modified by cultural understanding. One of the things that culture would do would be to dignify public office and dignify it by pointing out clearly to the conscious experience of man the responsibilities of office so that man would regard seriously as his proper contribution to society opportunities which he now exploits largely for personal profit. And this type of motion would be cultural and would be an ascent. The effort to elect an honest man under the present conditions will always be of doubtful merit for the simple reason that he is unable to move if elected. Whereas culture would give him an environment in which honor and honesty would be supported. And uh, anthropologists are of the opinion that through circumstances or necessity, we will raise the level of our leadership considerably in the next century. We must do so in order to survive. Culture bringing into our lives also greater harmoniousness by reducing the hazards of life, by reducing the negative and adverse um, uh, experiences and observations with which we distort our present psychology, might very well add considerably to our health and assist us in the advancement of uh, our hope of uh, overcoming many of the forms of sickness and dilemma which burden us likewise. Culture, in terms of anthropology, if it became prevalent, could probably add from five to ten years to the life expectancy of the average person. In a culture system, the average American today could live and achieve a good length of life with full efficiency and be as able and as happy and as healthy at a hundred as he now is at fifty. The difference lies in wear and tear. And the wear and tear lies in the survival of barbarism beyond its proper time. It is therefore quite conceivable that our generations could be extended. And culture would be the only justification for the extension of them. There is no reason why anyone should live longer if he does not learn to live better. The mere continuance of his present state is neither attractive nor important. The individual can make enough trouble now in 60 or 70 years. And the great majority of persons are not missed not nearly as much as they think they are going to be. We make a certain formality of expressing our profound regrets and then in the privacy of our own lives give thanks. This situation is because of the low culture platform. If man, living to a hundred, was during this entire period culturally occupied, he would have a pleasant, happy life, and culture would make him companionable and compatible, which is not the case in most instances today. For culture must inevitably take away from him those crudities, those forms of savagery, which we sometimes refer to as egotism and selfishness. Thus, culture gives us greater 
promise of maturity of life. And this, in turn, immediately increases the rapidity of the cultural motion. An individual who is cultured beyond his present state can make a more rapid contribution to man's further culture than he can in his present state. Thus, culture increases culture. And that which in the past might have required a thousand years might well be affected today in a hundred due to the differences in the available instruments of progress. Culture also becomes a, a, a very valuable solution uh, to the upset and inconsistent industrial life of our people. No one can doubt that sometime, somewhere, the productive ingenuity of the race must be stalemated. In the sense that we are already overproducing in order to maintain the type of economic level that we feel to be necessary. Inflation probably cannot be stopped for a long time, but inflation cannot be indefinitely maintained. There is no possibility of the individual living continuously above the level of the reasonable, going on this way indefinitely, in a world of increasing populations, in a world of the constant and inevitable reduction of basic assets, he cannot go on forever building his world around the concept that dominates it today. He is bound ultimately to find himself at the end of his resources of expansion. And even if he finds other worlds to conquer, he only puts off the inevitable evil day. He cannot, in nature, go on this way without bringing his ambitions and his programs and projects within the boundaries of a protective, disciplining culture. If, however, in the course of the next century, he becomes somewhat more cultural. So that value becomes of greater importance to him. It will inevitably affect his industries, his economics, and everything that he now knows. If he becomes cultural, however, he need not regard these changes as dangerous to his happiness. We may say that even now many persons realize that cultural program is dangerous only to our unhappiness. And that if we uh, once begin to move as cultural beings, we will find that our joy increases in what we are and what we do. And we no longer depend for our total recreation upon what we have. There is a change in basic psychology here, which is the indication of culture. Culture is not a measure of wealth. It is a measure of attainment. And even now, in many cultures, worldly goods are comparatively unimportant. And there are many countries today, uh, so-called highly advanced countries, in which a person is measured by his attainments primarily. The fact that this does not prevail as it should in this country means correction is indicated because we cannot continue on the ground that mere possession constitutes culture or that the person who possesses has in this way fulfilled his total destiny. His cultural life must be strengthened. If this is the case and we are able to release some part of our effort from this dynamic struggle for things, we shall find our entire pattern settle down to something in which rugged competition is no longer necessary in order that we shall attain ends that are completely satisfactory to ourselves. Only then, if we use this incline upward rather than pushing only forward, can we find solution? There is no solution in the present economic pressure. 
this moving forward that each year's sales must be measured only by the preceding year. And that if we do not top what we have done on the best year we ever had, we are dismal failures. This type of thinking cannot go on without destroying man spiritually, morally, psychologically, and physically. So culture points out the, the release that is given by permitting the individual to become aware of the wealth of personal self-expression, the wealth of sharing thought, the wealth of loving beauty, the wealth of creating rather than merely perpetuating. And uh, many uh, anthropologists who are aware of the arts and these things uh, think in terms of music on this type of subject. The development of very excellent reproducing equipment has practically destroyed the individual's inclination to become a musician. Whereas 50 years ago, the family nearly always had someone who could uh, play the piano and two or three people who could sing, perhaps slightly off-key, but still to the general enjoyment. And everyone got up and did it. Now, there is something about doing it that is tremendously important. And the doing of a mediocre piece of music in a thoroughly mediocre style has still greater cultural significance than listening forever to the greatest music that has ever been composed, magnificently performed. So that the problem as to whether you have one, two, three, or four loudspeakers scattered around your room in order that you may get the sound from the front, from the back, from above and below at the same time and perhaps have the beautiful opportunity of hearing it also coming in the window from one of the neighbors. <laughs> this is regarded as progress, but this is progress only on the level because it is not lifting the individual. We may say, yes, it will give him music appreciation that he never had before. It is true that it may do so. There will be long-range motion in it. But this motion that is separated entirely from creative action becomes too much like indoctrination. We are not made cultural merely through our ears. We are not made cultural by what is done to us or for us primarily. It is what we release through ourselves that becomes the one magnificent satisfaction of culture. Thus the individual uh, can still be a comparatively dissatisfied person in the presence of magnificent equipment for music. He does not have the personal psychological therapy of personal performance, of actually learning to do something himself. These elements must also be corrected in the future, where creativity must be given greater consideration. The anthropologist, I think, would like to see some creative art as a part of every curriculum, and that no person should be permitted to graduate as a doctor of medicine or a doctor of law unless he also can prove on the occasion of his final examination that he is proficient on the Jews' harp, the harmonica, or something of that nature. He must be able to express himself creatively. He must not depend totally upon intellectual reconstruction and continual uh, circulation of other people's ideas. He has got to get into creativity. Creativity is culture. We are happy, however, in seeing that some of these facts are beginning to be more obvious than they ever were before. The anthropologist says this is the proof of culture motion. We have come from the Greeks to now, and more persons probably than ever before, including the time of the Greeks, are aware of the need. In the time of the golden age of Pericles, fifty or a hundred 
great human beings were aware of the need in a great way. Today, 25 centuries later, two and a half billion human beings are to some measure, in some way, aware of need. Not as greatly as the Greek, but still the tremendous diffusion of the realization of need. And whereas there were 150 articulate Greeks who could tell the story, there are probably today a million articulate people who can tell the story. Perhaps not as thoroughly as the Greeks did, but sufficiently to show that the motion of culture has gradually communicated itself to groups, to masses, and to the total body of humanity, whereas at one time it was almost a small autocratic group locked within the boundary of its own circle and talking only to its own kind. This point is a very important one in representing cultural motion. It shows the diffusion. It shows it when we see everywhere the increase of art interest, of culture, the advancement of many things uh, that uh, speak of great culture, but at this time speak only of a longing which the individual has never integrated in himself into the statement that this is culture that I need. He has never stated that. He has simply felt the hunger and eaten as he could but he has never learned the laws of the dietetics of culture. He has never learned what its nutrition is or how it should be administered. But he is moving toward it. What then would we say would have the effect upon uh, the total growth of these beings? Going back to the first question we started with this evening, the growth of soul through body. The growth of body after maturity of years does not appear to be very obvious to us. We presume and assume that it maintains itself until decrepitude sets in. Actually, body can constantly grow. Body is either constantly growing or constantly decaying, one or the other. It never stands still. Consequently, anything which vitalizes the inner life of the individual contributes that vitality to body. Also, body under culture is in a constant state of refinement, and that is sensitizing of its elements. Twenty years of culture will change the cellular structure of the brain. Twenty years of culture will cause the individual to have command and control of nervous reflexes that he did not have before because he never called upon them before. And our psychological life also calls upon functions. It is not merely our physical living that demands functional coordination. There are in the body of man innumerable functional processes which have to do with the transmission of the psychic life of the individual into activity. The culture refines and strengthens these bridges, therefore giving the being in the body ever greater areas of function and enabling it to release itself more adequately through the body. If in the course of culture the individual transforms his mechanism from a $25 radio to a $200 radio, he is going to have better receptivity of something, because he has better instrument to receive with. The program may be quite the same program, if it's coming from within himself, but it is going to sound better he is going to suddenly come to the conclusion that the program is better. That is the way he is going to immediately analyze it. He is going to say, when I heard it before with this other equipment, I am quite certain it was off key. Now, with this better equipment, it seems to be on key. And he is going to blame or assume that the program has changed. But actually, he is providing an instrument by means of which psychic motion coming into body will not be as distorted or inhibited by lack of available instruments of expression. Also, culture induces the individual to attain greater skillfulness, producing faculty capacities and intellectual abilities uh, better suited to express himself, better suited to interpret, 
and better suited to discover new and more useful means of using the energies and powers and faculties which he possesses. We may then inevitably assume that culture which produces leisure, which is the foundation of civilization, is important. True leisure, however, demands of the individual true use of leisure. And without civilization as a factor in his consciousness, leisure cannot be used. Leisure wasted in dissipation is a sin against culture as far as our great need of today is concerned. Yet it will continue unless the individual becomes aware of better usage, becomes trained in these situations. It is not inconceivable in the possibility of culture that within a very comparatively short time, perhaps a few centuries, that most of the flagrant evils of our time could be minimized to the degree that they would be comparatively negligible. There is no reason why culture cannot correct crime. Yet we have taken the attitude that crime we will have with us always, along with war. There have been many learned volumes written to the uh, point that wars are inevitable, and that we will always have them. This is science moving on a level, assuming that tomorrow and forever will be like today as far as the psychic life of people is concerned. But change the people, and you break all patterns of expectancy. Another kind of person will not have these wars. It is only the kind of person who has wars who will have wars. And culture will not permit this. Culture taking over will find means of arbitration or will finally dissolve the problem which even requires arbitration. If then culture can take over in a major manner, several important fields of living can be immediately assisted. Domestic relationships can be easily handled. Many things now impossible will not any longer be impossible. They may still be difficult. The impossible will become difficult. The difficult will become easy, and the easy will cease to exist. These things, step by step, will be eliminated by the progress of things. Now, culture also, moving into biology, points out that cultural sympathy will probably ultimately solve racial problems. Both your philosophical and uh, your anthropological school see no reason to question that ultimately your racial problem will end and that we will have a race which has absorbed all races. And just as all races came from one, primarily, so all races trend inevitably toward one. The forcing of such union is non-cultural, but the gradual permitting of that which becomes obviously necessary, good, proper, and acceptable to occur is cultural. Therefore, the cultured human being, over a period of ages, will probably find his own proper and reasonable solutions to religious problems, racial problems, national problems, and personal problems. There is no problem that will withstand a kindly understanding, and that is where culture must come. Anthropology is therefore dedicated on a field of utility to a battle for a cultured way of life for the whole world, on the grounds that by attaining this, mankind will overcome the great adversaries which have prevented peace and a prevented fraternity among men. That having overcome these adversaries, energy will then be released from wrong use. And the individual who has been fighting for his errors down through the ages will now have energy for progress. And more energy has been used to block progress by sincere people 
than has ever been endeavored into that progress itself. If we could take all the obstacles put together, we would find that they overwhelmingly have exhausted the energy resources of man for ages. Anthropology says this is not necessary. That what we must have is all energy conserved for progress. True progress being man's ethical victory, his cultural victory over necessity. Man, a million years ago probably, conquered his primary necessities. He is now conquering his secondary necessities which arise from his appetites. They are not necessities at all. They are luxuries which he has found or accepted to be necessary. Culture will assist him to achieve a victory over his luxuries and by so doing rededicate him to the essential progress of his race or his creation or his time or whatever may be the unit with which he is immediately concerned. It will, however, give him a growing in, uh, non-immediate concern for the common good of all things and thus bring about a change. And the uh, optimistic anthropologist believes that we can live to see important development in these directions and that within the next few centuries we may actually find the solution not by the expected roots but by the fact that the solution has always been in man if man would have the courage and the vision to let it express itself through his life well our time is up so I guess